It's California edition. I'm Brad Palmer and Cheryl Brown is back. She is a member of the California State Assembly. Ma'am, I want to speak with you about what's known as the cap and trade program. It's been controversial for God, 10 years, it seems. Mm -hmm. The voters mm -hmm. had a chance to delay it mm -hmm. with Prop, I think it was 32. They voted against the delay. Mm -hmm. um, so here we are, and it appears as a part of the cap and trade program, there is a trigger which on January 1st, a certain tax would come into play that would increase gasoline prices at the pump, yes. am I right? Yes, you're absolutely correct. Explain what's going but on But what's here. going to happen, many people say, it's not a tax, but what's going to happen is the oil companies are going to then, transportation uh, fuels are going to become a part of cap and trade. I see. So therefore, they will have to pay. And pass um, on. And, pa and so, so what a business usually does is pass the cost on right. to consumers. And I try to explain that to people, that's kind of the way right. businesses do business. Yes, they right. do, yes. And so um, what's going to happen if it doesn't uh, change, is on January 1, every one of our citizens who drives a car and uses, consumes gasoline, will have to pay at least 15 cents a gallon more. What's the purpose of this charge, fee, tax, whatever well, you want to call it? The purpose of cap and trade is to reduce greenhouse emissions. Right. And so if you reduce greenhouse emissions and if you have a program that says you're going to reduce this, you have to, um, you would have to pay for. Right, your excess pollution. Yeah. I understand. That's, that's, what, that's what they're gonna have to do is pay for the excess pollution or pay that for right. that, for that nebulous kind of thing right. that they would need to use. So um, your view, and I know the view of many of your colleagues, including Republicans, is maybe now is not the time to trigger this element of cap and trade. Right, and we need to go back. Um, we've, we've been using cap and trade and we've been in cap and trade right now for the past um, year, year and a half. Sure. And it has, it has helped our, um, our state We've been able to use the money to help to um, to borrow the money right. to, to help balance the budget. And I know that the and governor has looked towards cap and trade for high speed rail. Right, and he wants to use it. And many people get upset and say, "Well, you shouldn't have high speed rail." Well, cap and trade fits well into that because it takes the gas guzzling cars off the One road. One could argue that's what they say. One could argue, and so that would be that's. That's one position or one point of it. But getting back to well, how it's going to affect us is that that charge that the gas companies, oil companies are going to have to pay will be passed on to the consumers. Um, once that's passed on to consumers, and especially in my district, District 47, we really can't afford it because so many of our um, citizens they travel to Los Angeles. Right, they you travel. represent San Bernardino County, right. and it's and a they have district, to, right. Right, we a lot have, of commuting. And, and we have a trucking industry that we depend on, that we depend on for our jobs, we depend on it for everything. So, so. what are you looking to do? Well, um, I've co-authored with, uh, with Assemblymember Perea a bill, AB 96. Mm -hmm. And um, what we're asking is that we just delay it until 2018 to give our communities an opportunity to know um, about it, number one, and then give them an opportunity to maybe buy hybrids, maybe buy the electric cars. It's just going to be too much too soon. Do you believe that by 2018 the economies of scale will be such that the hybrids, the electrics will be affordable enough because they are coming down. They co and, they're coming down. And, and the more people buy them, the right. more they'll come down. And so I guess, you know, one could ask, if not now, when? You know, what's the magic with 2018 as opposed to 2015 or 2020 for that matter? Right. Well, it just gives us a little bit of breathing room just to say, let's, let's not do it 2015. I, let's see what we can do to, um, to, to delay it just enough so that we can get our our constituents on the same page. Now, could the legislation be passed and still have California meet its goals that are required by uh, 
the Global Warming Act of 2006? Because we have a 2020 deadline, I believe. Right, we have a 2020 deadline, and so we're saying 2018. But does that give we us enough still, time to meet that still, deadline? We could still work on meeting that deadline. I don't know if we're going to meet the deadline right. as, it re, as it exists today. I, I'm, I think it's fair to say that you would likely get Republican support for this provision. Uh, and with that and a combination of Democrats, you probably could get this passed out of the House and Senate. But then you have a governor who hasn't come out, I believe, with regard to this question. There's been a lot of noise about it, but we know he is a proponent of reducing greenhouse gases. We know he's a proponent of cap and trade. I mean, if you start taking cap and trade money away, there may be less money for high-speed rail, one of his pet projects. So any sense of where the governor is going to be on this? We have not spoken with the governor, but I'm sure that when the governor... Um, looks at our issues and our problems. Most of the pollution, first of all, is, is generated in what I call the spine of California. And that starts in Sacramento, comes all the way down the interior of California mm. and down to Imperial. Mm. And whenever you look at the, uh, when you look at the um, California Enviro Shield, mm -hmm. it'll show you exactly where all that pollution is and we are in the center of it. So we want to clean it up. Which clearly, in the Inland Empire. We definitely Empire. want to clean it up, and the Inland Empire is hit very, very hard. The cap-and-trade money is supposed to go to those communities to do just what we're talking about. So could one argue maybe you want the money sooner rather than later? Well, we would love to have it, but <laughs> we have, right now, we've had several auctions, mm -hmm. and I think um, the first auction netted something like $500 million. The second auction was probably $300 million. And so when you look at that, and, and the legislation says that of, I think it's a quarter of that is supposed to come to disadvantaged communities, um, I think is it coming? we could do. We I could mean, part do. of your district is disadvantaged. I mean, you have some Much beautiful communities yeah. as well. But, mm -hmm. but are you seeing that money flow? Not yet. Oh, there's nothing, there's nothing in place yet mm. so that we can see it flow. I want to talk about the drought. It is so hot in the Inland Empire. I mean, we're living it. It is really oppressive. And when you combine the oppressive heat with the drought, I have to think you and your constituents, you're melting. You know, we are. But um, our constituents, I don't know if, I don't know if the word has gone out so that it it is dire. You know, it's funny you us. say that. I was recently yeah. speaking with uh, the head of public utilities, or mm -hmm. one of the heads of public utilities for mm -hmm. the Riverside Public Utility. He's the AGM of water. And I mentioned him, there was a poll, LA Times, mm -hmm. recently, statewide poll. 89% characterized the drought as a major problem, mm -hmm. but only 16% have said they've been affected right. to a major degree. So it's just so what you're saying. People don't, we don't feel it yet. We, we know it intellectually, right. mm -hmm. but we don't feel it. Right. And what I'm trying to do is to get people to cut back on their water usage, right. especially unnecessary. Um, what, what the cities, however, do, and what gardeners want to do, is they want you to continue to water your lawn. Can't do that. We have to cut back, and I've had to cut back. Mine is getting a little brown. Now. Right, and let's talk about, you have some legislation dealing with brown lawns. Tell I us had, about it. I had some legislation. Well, but you merged it. You merged yeah, it with I merged, a friend. I merged it with uh, my friend right. uh, Norma Torres, uh -huh. and um, we came up with we came up with a bill that would... Um, is it Torres or Campos? I'm sorry, way? Campos. Perfect. No yeah. problem. Sometimes. It's all good. We all talk. It's all good. <laughs> but, and so, but, but what I did was we they talked to us and said, you know, these two bills are similar. Right. My bill came about as a result of personal experience in a city that I know where people had brown lawns and they were getting fined By HOAs. for having... No, but not the HOAs. This is just a regular community. So this bill would prevent that? My bill would prevent that. But and her Nora's bill, bill? Her bill dealt just with... Um, just with the HOAs. We'll have to see what happens. Yeah, Her homo. name is Cheryl Brown. She is a member of the California State Assembly on Bride Pomerantz. It's California edition. <laughs>